cabeza. All right. It's good to be here tonight. Welcome you to Cedar Grove tonight. We're going to go back and uh, back into talking about our Psalms tonight. We're probably not going to talk about the Psalms as much as we're going to talk about the subject, okay? And so uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, this here is, uh, is actually the, uh, I guess when I had this conversation a while back, this was one of the things that was concerning, was what's called imprecatory psalms. And uh, that's a big fancy word that just means curse. <laughs> it's just curse, that's what it is. Um, uh, they're, they're psalms that have a curse at attached to them. And uh, so as you look at that, imprecatory psalms, uh, contained within the book of Psalms of the Hebrew Bible are those that imprecate, uh, invoke judgment, calamity, or curses upon one's enemies or uh, those perceived as enemies of God. And major imprecatory Psalms include Psalm 69 and 109. And then you see that whole list right there, and we're going to look at one of those in just a little bit, uh, are also considered imprecatory. Uh, as an example, Psalm 69, 24 states towards God, Pour out your indignation on them and let your burning anger overtake them. And I mean, that sounds pretty rough, you know. And so, uh, what are imprecatory psalms and should we pray them? So, that's going to be kind of the idea that we're going to go after. Uh, and I'm going to try to give y'all some help as we do that, okay? So, let's go down and look at what it says here. Many, many uh, believe these imprecatory prayers, uh, if it's legitimate to call them prayers, are beneath the dignity of the Christian and are not to be viewed as examples for us to follow. They are rather the expressions of man's sinful desires, vengeance uh, on his enemies. These psalms... Are, uh, so some have said are not God's precepts but man's defective prayers they're cold blooded expressions of, of malignant cruelty and must never be regarded as inspired of God now let's just stop a minute that is not my saying Okay, I want y'all to know that I copied and pasted this and I'll tell you where it came from in just a minute All right. so I'm reading you and what, I, what I'm giving you is the world's view of, uh, or some people's view of, of these, these types of psalms. We can't dismiss the problem by insisting such prayers are found only in the Old Testament. And that's where I want to go at tonight. Uh, uh, I kind of want to go in the opposite direction. Or that they reflect a substandard morality uh, inappropriate to the New Testament Christian. Both Testaments present the same perfect and exalted standard for life. God's moral law is immutable and is everywhere the, uh, the same. We must be careful never to pit Scripture against Scripture, as if to suggest that the Old Testament calls for a different type or perhaps inferior ethical response to one's enemies than does the New Testament. All right? Now, like I say, I'm going to I'm going to give you, as we finish this thing up, I'm going to give you where this came from, and you're going to, you're going to learn a little something about uh, the lens that we look through, okay? Furthermore, one must address the fact in the New Testament, similar imprecations, I can't say that, on the enemies of God are found. So the first one that I have there is Luke 10, Verses 10 through 16. You may want to go look that up in your Bible. I have it there in your notes. Uh, but you're only going to get part of it. You're not going to get the full context. Okay. Uh, in this particular passage, Jesus is sending out his disciples to do ministry. He has empowered them and he's sending them out to do ministry. So starting in verse 10, he says, But into whatsoever city you enter... And they receive you not. Go your ways out into the street of the same, uh, of the same, and say, 
Even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Okay. Notwithstanding, be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in the day of Sodom and in the city, in that city. Woe to the unrepented uh, cities. Uh, that, that's not scripture, that's the, that's the hidden. Woe unto the um, Chorazan. Woe unto the Bestida. Um, for the mighty works that has been done in Tyre and Sodom, which have been done unto you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Uh, let me get my page turned. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. And thou Capernaum, which are exalted in heaven, shall be thrusted down to hell. He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. So, let me ask you a question about that. Now, this is one of the ones that he's, this is this particular guy is pointing out in the New Testament. He's saying here is an imprecatory prayer. Okay. What is the context of Jesus sending out his disciples? Who's he sending them to? Yes. Don't you go to the Gentiles, only to the lost sheep of Israel. Okay. So it's to the Jews. What is Jesus offering to the Jews in that day? He's offering the kingdom. I will set myself up on my father's David's throne if y'all will receive me as Messiah. Okay? They reject me. And that's what that's the whole idea behind this. If you reject me at this point in time. It's going to be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon. Why? Because they're Gentiles. And they received Jesus. What little bit that he was in that area, they received the messages that he, he preached. And they trusted him as, as Messiah or as Savior. But the Jews, the ones that he went to, the ones that God had predicted he would come to, they were denying. All right, so put it in the context. All right, so you've got to put it in the context of what's there. All right, so let's look at the next one. We might have to go look at this one. Uh, it depends on how much y'all know about the book of Galatians. Galatians 1.8. Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's an anathema. What was going on in the book of Galatians? Does anybody know? What, what's the book of Galatians? What is it for? What, what was Paul's intent? We talked about intent a while ago with sermons. What, what was Paul's intent for the book of Galatians? What was the problem at, at, at Galatia? Yeah, they were wanting to put them back under the law. They were wanting to say Christ plus the law. Okay, you Gentiles, because the, the book uh, at Galatia, they were they were mainly Gentiles. You you bunch of Gentiles, y'all got to become Jews in order to be real Christians. Okay, and so that is important, especially in the next couple verses there. But what he's saying, that is not the gospel. It's not Jesus, grace and mercy plus works. It is grace alone. We are saved through faith. By grace alone and nothing else. Okay? My works don't save me. The man on the cross that cried out to Jesus to remember him when he got in paradise, that man went to heaven with no works whatsoever. He went to heaven with faith. Okay? Grace alone saves us. Grace alone. All right? And so that's what Paul's dealing with in this book. These Judaizers are coming in behind him. If you look at the book of Acts, they're following him behind him just on his heels and running him out of every place that he goes and they're coming in and trying to upset the work of God all the way down through there and so what Paul is saying he says if they preach another gospel it's not the gospel so let that person be accursed 
It don't matter if it's an angel because, whoo, let's, let's calm down. Ain't that what I need to say? Ain't that what Taylor said? Calm down. Calm down. So, let's calm down. Get the motor idling. What was it that brought Islam to Muhammad? What was it that brought Mormonism to Joseph Smith? Don't matter if it's a person or if it's an angel. They preach any other gospel beside the gospel that has been delivered to you by us apostles. Let them be accursed because what they're doing is trying to take people to hell. Okay? So that, that's what he's saying. Galatians chapter 5, verses 11 and 12 deals with this even more. And I'm not going to try to be crude here, but I'm going to tell you what, what it's actually talking about. Verses 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circ circumcision, why do I yet, yet suffer, suffer persecution? So what he's asking them, he's not saying he does preach circumcision. He's saying if, if I came to y'all and that's what I preached, why am I being persecuted by these people? Okay? That's, that's what he's asking. But now I want you to look what he says. Then is the offense on the cross ceased. And he says this in verse 12. And this is what they were talking about being imprecatory. I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. And what he's talking about right there, he's talking to the men. And he said instead of just because if you put it into context, this is a few verses above. Instead of just being circumcised, just castrate yourself. That's what's going to make you closer to Jesus. And that's what, that's what he's asking. That's what he's saying. Okay? He's not talking about people being cut off. He's talking about what they were, what they were concerned with. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 21 and 22. Here's another imprecatory place. The salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be an anathema, maranatha. Okay? What does maranatha mean? Does anybody know? Come quickly. Yeah. So, anathema, so he's an anathema, is a curse. So let any man that love not the Lord Jesus be accursed. And let the Lord come quickly. Okay? So what, what, what is the, the real truth there? I've got this later on in your notes. Go, with a, go over to Revelation chapter 22 real quick. I have this, like I say, in your notes later on, and we'll talk about it later on, but... Say amen when you're there. Okay. Chapter 22, look with me in verse 20. He which testify these things saith, Surely I come quickly. And you see they're in red letters. Amen. So let it be so. And then I want you to look at this last little bit. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And like I say, this is one of my points at the very end of this but I'm going to go ahead and tell you when I say even so come Lord Jesus and I know what's going to happen to the people that have not received Jesus Christ as Savior I'm actually in some way pronouncing a curse on them because I'm asking Jesus to come back you know what I'm saying does that make sense but I'm asking Jesus to do what he's already said he's going to do. He said, I'm coming quickly. So even so, come, come Lord Jesus. I'm ready to see you. I'm ready to see you. There's others that's not. Okay. Uh, and, and in God's sovereignty and his sovereign time, that day will come in the day that it's supposed to come. Okay. <laughs> and it won't come any quicker if I pray it every day. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so that's part of what's going on there. The only one that they mention here is this next one that I think <coughs> gives us any kind of trouble at all. 
And that is at the end of Paul's life, the last book that he wrote was 2 Timothy. And at the end of his life, he's right there. there he's, he's hearing them sharpen the sword, even as he's writing. And as he gets down to the last chapter that he pins, that we know that he pins, he says this in verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord rewardeth him according to his works. Now that is a little rough. You know what I'm saying? But the thing about it is, will the Lord reward him for his work? Yeah, yeah. And, and so Paul's speaking the truth there more than I think he's speaking a curse. He knew that this guy had, had really, really done a number on him. And some people think it's the, the bonds that they had him on. Some thinks it's some other things. I don't really know, but uh, Paul wasn't too happy with him. Okay, Paul was not happy with him. All right. So I'm going to go down through these, through these things right here, and then we're going to go back up, and we're going to pick up a, a one of the Psalms and look at it. Okay? So consider the prayer request, Thy kingdom come, Matthew 6.10. This is invoked divine judgment on all other kingdoms and all those who oppose the reign of God. <coughs> Even Jesus used imprecatory language, and we see all that there. Consider Peter's citation of the imprecatory section in uh, Psalm 69 and 109 in reference to Judas. Now see, here's another one of the things that I kind of disagree with what the guy had to say. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate, and let no man dwell in it. And his office let another man take. So let me ask you this. Was Peter invoking that on him, or was Scripture invoking that on him? Yes, exactly. Scripture is, Jesus made it clear that Scripture spoke of him. So that's, that's it's, Peter was rightfully putting it on him through the Holy Spirit. He was just speaking the truth that Scripture had already put there. All right? So, um, you see some things there down at the bottom of it. Uh, I, I want you to look at number one. If you see the number one, I should have spaced down. What we read in these Old Testament Psalms are not emotional, uncontrolled outbursts by otherwise sane and compassionate people. They're calculated petitions, not sp spontaneous explosions of bad temper. When David's writing, and we're going to look at one of these that David wrote here in just a minute. When David's writing, he is he's literally crying out to God to take the reins of this vengeance. Much of what Romans 12 says, give room for the vengeance of God. Let him do the justice. And that's what he's crying out for. I can't take care of it, Lord, but you can. It's not that he's got a bad temper. I mean, if David had a bad temper, and David wrote most of these imprecatory psalms, if David had a bad temper, what would he have done to Saul two different times? I mean, he had the opportunity to kill the man twice. The very man that he's writing some of these psalms about. What would David have done to Absalom? He actually wrote one of these psalms con uh, in, in connection to Absalom. What would he have done to Absalom? But what did he do? What did he do to the guy when he crossed the, the, the water and the guy's throwing rocks at him and spitting at him and cursing him as he's going? I mean, he had his mighty men wanted to go back and take his guy's head off. No, leave him alone. Okay. God will take care of him. So we have to look at David in the context of David when he he's not a vengeful man. He really isn't. Matter of fact, David was more quick to take vengeance on somebody on somebody else's behalf than his own behalf. You think about when the man came and was telling him, oh, I killed Saul. Your enemy. David had him killed. You know, he shouldn't have killed Saul. Saul was God's anointed. Why'd you do that? You know, and, and so uh, 
You've got to look at David inside the context of David. We're not saying that he's some hateful man, okay? Number two, these prayers are not expressions of personal vengeance. The Old Testament was as much opposed to seeking personal vengeance against one's personal enemies as the New Testament. Okay, she don't have her stuff up there. So let, let's look at Exodus 23. Because we need to see this so we can know what Scripture says. Twenty-three. And if you get there before I do, you just wait. No, me and Sam getting up there now. I see that. My two pages that I need are stuck together. Somebody read it for me. Okay, so this is the man that hates you, and you can you can let his John Deere sit out there and blow up in the, in the ditch, you know. But what, is, what does Scripture say? Scripture says you're to look after your enemy, the people that hate you as well. Okay, uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 and 18. I actually have that in front of me. Um, 17 and 18. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in no wise, any wise rebuke any neighbor and not, and not suffer sin upon him. Uh, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. That sounds like New Testament talking to me, don't it, to you? Okay? So we're not to... Ex- even in the Old Testament, they were not to... Uh, Seek vengeance on on those that, uh, especially those that were around them. So here's the things I want you to consider real quick. And like I say, I want to look at one of these psalms before before we get out of here. Things to consider. In the context of the book of the law, or the books of the law, you're not to harm your brother, i.e., in my opinion, another Israelite. Okay? So when they're talking about your brother there, they're talking about an Israelite. Um because they are of the same blood. When looking at uh, the other Old Testament passages, a lot of times these enemies were outside of the Israelites. But it could be that they were unbelievers inside the camp and were working against God's plan, which would make them outside the, the camp even though they were in the, a part of the Israelites. Does that make sense? Everybody that is a member of a Baptist church is not a Christian. Okay? I I have said that since the day God gave me a voice to speak in the church. Okay. No, they haven't not yet. But I just speak to small crowds, so they probably they 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 just say, well, we'll just ignore him. But uh, I do know that the pastor of the largest church that was in Florida at one time. Uh, I heard him in an interview, and and he actually, they asked him about that very thing, and he said he felt like about 10% of the people that he had ministered to in his ministry in the largest church in Florida was actually born-again Christians, okay? And his, yeah, his ministry was a long time. Um, but uh, anyway, yes, it is sad. Um, but you got to... Let, let's let's plow that that row a minute. You got to consider, and I know you do. Y'all, y'all know as much scripture as I do, but you got to consider the Jews. They were religious. Man, they were devout. They were more devout than any Baptist I've ever seen. They were they were devout in what they believed, but what they believed didn't change their heart. It didn't soften them. It didn't make them what God wanted them to be, which was holy. They, their holiness was in their self-righteousness. And so many people grow up in a church and they they get they they join the church, they get baptized, you know, and they go to Sunday school and they're part of this program and part of that program and part of the other program and they do and they do and they give and they do. But they never had it done to them. 
They never had that moment, that wow moment that they actually got saved. You know? and, and, and those are the hardest people to win. Paul, Paul says in our next passage of Scripture in the book of Romans, when we get back there, he says, I wanted to take the gospel where no man's been. Why? Well, that ground's softer. Yeah. It hadn't been treaded on by everybody in this country. Okay. Number two, all verses must be looked at in context. Folks, if I can't teach you nothing else in my lifetime, I don't care if it's me, if it's Dr. Big Britches or Dr. Do Best or whatever, if, if somebody says something, take your Bible and look at it and make sure that's what it says in the context. In the context. I, I was telling my, my daughter the other day, we was talking about a, a pastor. He's one of the, I, I, y'all heard it. One of the best pastors I know of. One of the best preachers I know of. But he made a mistake. And I caught the mistake because I had time to go look up what he was talking about. And it was there. It, it, uh, the, the, what, the word he said was there wasn't there. It, it's not there. In no version, in no, no manuscript, in Greek manuscripts, it's not there. Okay? He made a mistake. He didn't mean to mis- make a mistake. He wasn't trying to mislead nobody. But he made a mistake. You understand what I'm saying? I make mistakes. You need to check behind me, boy. I tell you what. Ask my wife. You need to check me out. Everything you look at needs to be in the context of what it says. Okay? Third, we play down theology. But theology, especially among those teaching us, writing, pastoring, lecturing, blogging, plays a huge part in how those people see the text and drives what they're teaching. Okay? For example, now this comes down to where we got our notes set tonight. For example, the one one of the people that I looked at in this particular study, his bio, and I, we're not going to give his name, this is what he says, I'm an amillennial, Calvinistic, charismatic, creo, uh, credo, Baptistic, complementarian, Christian hedonist who loves his wife for 44 years, has two daughters, four grandchildren, loves books, baseball, movies, da 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 da. Well, that drove the way he seen what he was talking about, that view. Okay? Just like when I, as a dispensationalist, look at it, it drives the way I see it. Okay? So it drives it. So we need to understand that those things that we're reading and those blogs that we see and those uh, whatever it is, Twitter and Twitter and Tweety Bird accounts, all that stuff, it, it all has theology behind it. Okay. Fourth, some of these curses are more stated fact, and we talked about that. And, and here, here we go talking about the Revelation passage. We pray even so come Lord Jesus. We're praying for desire that will uh, bring the very destruction of others who don't know Jesus as their personal Savior. But we're praying it. And we're not praying it dr- destruction on them. We're praying, Lord, come on and do your thing. Okay? Now, let's go to one of the Psalms real quick. I want to back up and do one of them because that's what we're supposed to be doing. But I wanted to see, I wanted you to see how some of this other stuff that people are trying to attach into it, I don't believe really fits into it, okay? Let's go to uh, Psalm 35. Psalm 35. I got Psalms in my Bible, I know it do. There they are. Psalm 35. All right, what does our superscription say? Psalm 
Okay. A psalm, a psalm of David. So, so it, the superscription is giving us who wrote it. A psalm of David. Okay. You, you, I'm going to have to get me one of them Bibles you got. <laughs> got some extra stuff in it. <laughs> uh, all right. So <laughs> that, that might have been put in there by the, by the actually tra translators and, uh, to, to try to give you an idea of what's in it. But it's a Psalm of David. So let's look at what David has to say. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. So now what's David asking? Who is David? He's the king. What is David asking God to do right there? They're against God because David is the king. Okay? And, and, God, and God had put him there in, in their place, uh, in his place. And so he, he asked him in verse 2, Take hold of your shield and your buckler, okay? And, and stand up for my help. Draw out your spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Okay? Do you think David had the ability to take one person in the kingdom or two people or five or 20 or 100 that was in the kingdom? Do you think he had the ability to say, I want them executed? Yeah. That ain't what David wanted. He wanted God to fight the battle. He wanted God to fight the battle. Now, why would we want God to fight the battle? Let, let, let's, just, let's flesh this out a bit. Why would I want God to fight my battles? Well, it does. Yeah, yeah. That would be, you know, that would be a. a, a it is, and, and go ahead. Yes, keep it righteous. Exactly. That was where I was going. It would keep it righteous. Okay. Because I, I may not be righteous. I may be right. But I may not be righteous in being right. Does that make sense? And, and so I agree 100%. It keeps... When I ask God to intervene in this situation, He knows the ins and outs of my heart. He knows where I'm wrong. He knows where I'm right. He knows where I'm even deceiving myself. My heart is wicked above all things. And I can be deceived thereby, and so can you, okay? <laughs> and, and so I know that. David knows that. And so David's saying, Lord, you, you know my heart. You know their hearts. You know what your plan is. Rise up. Protect me and fight, fight for me, okay? And so it'll be done in righteousness, okay? Let's go on and look at what else he says. Um, verse 4. Let them be confounded and put to shame and that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to uh, confusion that divides my hurt. So again, you take that and, and you take uh, you, you, you take them that, uh, that, they're, that they're stopped in their way. So David's telling him, he says, Lord, Stop the very path that they're, that they're going on. How often, as Christians now, how often do we talk about God closing the door? God closing the door. You know, I'm heading down this road, and God closed that door, and so uh, I, I know that it's Him. Well, that's what David's asking God to do, close that door so they'll, they'll, they'll have to stop. David could, David could shut the door on him. I guarantee you he could. Especially once he became king, king. But uh, that wasn't his idea. Then uh, he goes on, let them be confounded and, and put to shame that seek after my soul. Uh, let them be turned back and, and brought to confusion that devised my hurt. Uh, let them be as chafe before the wind. And let the angel of the Lord chase them. Okay. Do you think he's talking about chasing them? 
or chastising them. Yes, I think so too. Let the Lord spank them. Don't let me spank them because I, I'm going to either spank too hard or not enough. Let the Lord spank them. I have told this story and I've told this story and I don't have no new story to tell, so I'm just going to tell it again. When I was at Goodyear and I got a new job and they didn't want me to get that job. They really didn't. Okay, just the way it was. I, I pulled production every day on my machines. I was there every day on my machines. I had uh, like 19 years perfect attendance out of the 21 years I was there. And I had chicken pox for a week and a half one time. So, uh, I mean, I, they wanted me running machines. But I had seniority on everybody that put in for the job. I was the only man going to a woman's side of the plant. They brought me over there. They took me into the office and they threatened me. Now, this is no lie. They took me into the office, closed the door. They had a witness. I didn't. And they sat right there and they just threatened me every way they could. And then they opened the door. They sent me out. And they told me, they said, if you, if you can't do the job, we can't guarantee you you'll have a place to go back to. Okay. I had a job when I come here. I have one when I leave here. You know, and so, uh, so anyway, uh, the people that I was working with worked against me quite a bit. And there was one in particular that really worked against me. And man, I mean, it was every time I had to follow this lady, I was, uh, I was in the office every time. Now, the back story to her was she had a son that went to Mexico as a missionary and she was angry. She was angry. So she just hated Christians as a whole. She hated the fact I was a man. She hated the fact that it was uh, Christians. So finally, one day, I had enough. My boss is chewing me out. I said, well, let's go out here and look at the problem. Went out there and looked at the problem. The problem was cleaning. That's what they was. I cleaned. Every week, you're supposed to clean on Sunday night. I, I clean, and every every time I clean, there nobody else cleaned. There, there was this much dust, this much sterate and stuff in the in the shelves. Nobody else to clean. Everybody's supposed to clean every Sunday night. It should be clean, you know. I'm filthy, so I took my boss in there and I said, "Look, pull any pull any bin you want to. I don't care what bin it is." Not, not my bins, because we, we already determined. I told you I didn't clean mine this past Sunday. Pull any bin you want to. Where were they supposed to clean them? And she pulled them, and there it was, that much stir in. She turned red. I never heard nothing else about it. God took care of it. You know what I'm saying? I, I had to be honest. I wasn't doing it. I got tired of doing it. But God took care of it. If God fights our battles, it will be done correctly. It'll be the right amount of whooping going on. Okay? And there was. And, um, and so, that's what we see here. So let's go on. He's asking the, asking the angel of the Lord, which would be who? Yeah. Who would we say the angel of the Lord is? <laughs> <She's hiding. laughs> yes, I, I would say in most cases it would be Christ. It would be the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel of the Lord. That's who I'd say. In most cases, not all cases, but in most. Okay? Verse 6. Um, so it'd be a, what, what would it be? If it was Jesus, if he showed up, what would it be? Christophany. Christophany, not a theophany. A theophany is a burning bush, right? Or a wind, or a cloud. Okay, okay. All right. So, um, verse six: Let their back be dark and slippery. Or oh, excuse me, let their way be dark and slippery. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading two different verses at the same time. And, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. So, 
he, they don't want, he's, he's saying don't let them really see clearly how they're supposed to step in their path. And let it be slippery when they do step. That they, they can't get sure footing. Okay? And let the Lord persecute them. For without cause have they hid for me their net in the pit, which without a cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him uh, at unawares, and let his net that he had uh, hid catch himself. And to the very destruction let him fall okay so what's he saying he's saying the very scheme that he's he's playing for me let that scheme catch him have you ever seen anybody that happened to yeah they over here scheming and scheming and scheming and they end up getting caught in their own mousetrap don't they and uh you know what happens ah, 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 ah. right i have to watch cartoons with my my granddaughter right? it's like the only thing Papa knows is cartoons, ice cream, candy, and something to drink. Okay, that's it. That's all I'm good for. And uh, but we watch cartoons, and I mean, you see Wiley Coyote, and every time Wiley Coyote is trying to catch the Roadrunner or Bugs Bunny, who gets hurt? Wiley Coyote, right? And so uh, that's what David's saying. Let them get caught in their own devices. My soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. So he's, he said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise God and what he's doing. We've got to hurry. Uh, false witnesses did rise up against me. They, they had laid uh, to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. Let's, let's stop a minute. Now we're going to stop right here. But... Who is David trying to defend himself with? Who's, who's he calling on for a witness? Yeah. You know you know, I didn't do these things. Man, there's sometimes... One of the things they, they, they tell you as a young preacher boy, they'll say, there's going to be times the only thing you're sure of is your salvation and you'll call to preach. And sometimes you ain't going to be sure of your salvation. Okay? <laughs> But you're going to know you're called to preach. Well, David is the same way right here. He's saying, I know, I know, and you know. And you know they're lying to me. They're lying about me. And they're trying to persecute me with these lies. It's so hard when people bear false witness against us lie about something we said or done or some attitude we had it, it, it's, it's, it's terrible but it happens doesn't it? and what's worse than that is sometimes you don't have anybody to talk to they, they was something that happened and, and it, it ate me up man there wasn't nobody to talk to except the Lord and I've watched the Lord even that score. Not not that I even that score, but I watched the Lord even that score. That is what David is doing right here. And in my personal opinion, not in all of them, but in a lot of these imprecatory psalms, that's what's happening. It is the person is calling out to the Lord to be the one that does the fighting for them. I, do, I want you and your righteousness to be the judge of this thing and to handle this thing because I know it will be handled correctly. So now, let's go back to our question and I know y'all got to go home and I got to go home. I got a lot of stuff to do tomorrow and I got some things to do before I go to bed at night. But should we pray in precatory prayers? Yeah, I, I say yes too. If, if we're crying out to the Lord to set things right, we're asking Him to set things right because He knows how to set things right better than I do. I could, I could muster up an army to defend me and my view or whatever it is. But when I cry out to the Lord, when He gets through doing it, it's going to be done perfectly.
Exactly. And I believe David was willing for that. I really do. And I think that's why he was calling out on him to, to do that. Like I say, to, to make the righteousness right. And, and sometimes it is our heart. And just to go back to, and again, I'm not going to flesh this out, but just to go back to uh, the thing that hurt me so bad. Uh, even in that, I learned things about me, things I needed to do different, things that I had failed in. And you you got you to be honest in, in your failures. If you're not honest in your failures, you'll never grow. You'll never grow. And, uh, um, and, and so I, I was honest with myself in the things that I, I knew that, I'd done wrong, um, and um, but nevertheless, um, I do. I think sometimes we're the ones that have to change in this situation too. But I, I think I do. I believe that we can pray, Lord, you take the wheel, and and you you make it you make it right according to your will and your way. All right, all right. Let's uh, let's go home. Let's pray, and and we'll go home. And, Spend the rest of the evening working on schoolwork.